The Kraft Music Hall will not be presented, so we may bring you a Bob Hope comedy special. Every part of comics and artwork is a form of communication with other people. It's not just a, here, let me direct my thoughts at you as a dictation of concept, but it's hoping to convince you of how cool you think a visual could be or a story could be. And you're trying to communicate ideas and in one part storytelling and greater part just graphic impact. You're hoping to relate a sense of energy, urgency, and enthusiasm to people. That there's a lightning of spirit that comes out of superheroes that has always worked for me. That it isn't really about the practicality of what they might do about, it's not the practicality about grown men punching each other in costumes. It really isn't about that. It's a visual metaphor. And that metaphor could be for a lot of things, but it's mostly just about the energy and enthusiasm that can be found in the fun of life. details how advertising through television transforms strangers to your product into acquaintances and acquaintances into friends and friends into customers. You could almost say, as a result, that television puts into every living room a selling machine. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Kinescope. As we look back uh, to the early days of live television, uh, live television uh, kind of, uh, well, I guess in terms of live, in terms of they were moving, but I don't know how... Uh, how yeah, not life-like. Yeah, just... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> John Sutton uh, here, Gabe Hardman here, Jeff Parker. Um, I think we're going to be end up, we're going to end up talking more about the principles. Uh, for instance, the fact that we want to look at uh, uh, a, a weird side of uh, a great actor... That sometimes we may take for granted because of acting roles like this. Uh, there's Yul Brenner as Ramses, uh, as the gunslinger in The Magnificent Seven, and of course, the king and the king of Siam, the king and I. But he was also a director, and he directed uh, tonight's Studio One, The Storm from 1949, starring a great actress uh, who is she still with us, Marsha? Apparently, Hunt? she is. Apparently, she's 104 years old and still alive. Wow, good for Marsha Hunt because so why uh, why don't we have her as a guest on the show? You know she she was playing shuffleboard with Olivia Haviland the Haviland when I when I suggested the possibility. So uh, so guys, the the storm uh, uh, a bit overblown in terms of its title. Yeah, well, does anybody want to sum it up? I, okay, I'll sum it up. Um, <clears throat> I I. Uh, a failed actress who uh, is throwing in the towel and is leaving town to head back to her hometown and gets pickpocketed in the bus station, the train station, or is it a bus station? I think it's a bus station. Yeah. It's a bus station. Uh, so she's a sobbing mess up at the ticket counter when she realizes she has no money. Uh, this is when an opportunist decides I'm going to make her my wife and she goes along with it. There he so, is right there in the background. You can see him. So uh, red Mick flag uh, uh, <laughs> comprised yeah. of totally red flags. Uh, uh, nothing, nothing not a red flag about any aspect of this guy <laughs> or the way he yeah. approaches her. No. He takes her out for coffee and uh, and then they, they come together and he has a uh, a mysterious brother that, you know, he, he's also uh, known for doing things like if my brother ever comes around, don't talk to him. Yeah. Uh, it, literally, he never does anything that's not an enormous red flag. Yes. And uh, and it proceeds from there and ends in a body in the basement. Uh, it's a pretty small cast and uh, it's directed by Yo. <laughs> yeah. 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 So no, all that's yeah. correct. I mean, 
My feeling yeah. about this was that it was a fucking mess. Like that the it script was mess. terrible. But the but the funny thing is that this is the uh, this is the second time that they've staged this on Studio One, and the and I believe there's yet another version of it from 1953. What they saw in this script, I don't know, except for the part where it was adapted by Worthington Minor, who was the producer of the show. So I mean, perhaps. He, he it's, was a little more invested in this idea than everybody else. It's, uh, I guess it's it's paid for. Yes, and, that's and true. They're like, we got the script. <laughs> yep. And there's there's really more to talk about as far as Yul Brenner, Marsha Hunt, and Worthington Minor, rather than spend more than what we've already done on the actual story. Oh no, John! I think we need to delve much further into this. Well, and uh, well, <laughs> one more thing: uh, you got Rosencrantz and Gilderstein here at the bar. That uh, even tell us, boy, uh, I'll tell you, uh, Jimmy McFla McRed flag there uh, really uh, snowed over uh, Lady in the Rain. Yeah, she really shouldn't uh, proceed with the next 45 minutes of this story. And this guy yeah. goes, ain't it the truth? Ain't it the I truth? Know, I know. <laughs> it's so it's just so like everything is telegraphed. It's telegraphed to the point of ridiculousness. And yet no one's no. I I totally fail to understand what anyone's motivations are in it exactly who like i i'm not sure i've watched i, I think i watched it three times and wow. keeping uh well i think i watched i didn't want okay not entirely three times because I, I watched it once like maybe a year ago or something uh, or i started oh. to watch it never finished it right then watched it twice for this i it's like my brain slides off of the the fucking I, show every time I try to watch it because I just it's so kind of like uh, so lacking in credibility. I don't know what these people are doing. I don't know why they why they make the decisions they make. They're like it's ridiculous. Yeah, I'm so uh, sorry, and, guys. Truly, I mean it's. I, so I what? Guess no, I was no. Blinded, I mean, I was blinded by the credits because I'm like, no, oh, yeah, really? yeah, totally. It's, it's, it's that's interesting. I was too. Yeah. Well, it's and I Marsha think that. Yeah, and I think that it's definitely worth talking about Yul Brenner's relationship with live TV, which is basically just as a director. Uh, the, I mean, and, you know, Yul Brenner is one of these guys who, like, you know, he, he went around basically just tell, making up bullshit about his past, never really <laughs> telling anybody the truth about anything, and, you know, and, you know, came to the U.S. and play, you know, as a, you know, basically playing what they called gypsy music at the time, you know, right. and, uh, and the, you know, and he was a kind of hustler, you know, I mean, I think that he, you know, I think that's interesting in, in him, you know, and he did do some acting, but like he kind of seemed to sort of hustle his way into, uh, to uh, uh, being a director. And, I mean, I've worked with directors like that, you know, who, you know, may or may not have talent, may or may not, that may or may not be their passion, but they, but they can, you know, they can kind of, you know, they, they can get stuff, you know, and they can, you know, and, and they'll, they'll take opportunities. And, and it, it seems like that's a lot of who, who Yul Brenner was, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think that that's, that's interesting. I mean, it's everything about his biography is so kind of subjective seeming, you know, like he's, you know, like, I mean, he was from Vladivostok. He was, you know, they say where, you know, uh, you know, but he would go around telling people that he was, you know, Mongolian and that he was, you know, a prince and that he was, you know, that, uh, that he was born on a on an island off of Japan and that he, you know, I and mean, he would just tell anybody anything, which I can relate to this a little bit. I mean, I've, no, I've said, I, I mean, wish I'm I had done this. about my past, you know, at times, so, you know. No, agreed. And you'll forgive me as I'm fixing my camera. I don't know what happened here. But uh, a very interesting guy. And and again, what I love about learning about uh, Brenner was I learned a lot about Yul Brenner as a television director from uh, Sidney Lumet, who was yeah. one of his uh, assistant directors who he brought into television. Uh, Lumet, of course, a child actor who was doing a lot of stage. And Yul Brenner is like, Sidney, come to television. Nobody knows what the hell they're doing. They need good directors. I can teach you. And he did. And, uh, you know, Yul Brenner kind of responsible for Sidney Lermet's great career. Good eye. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, I, I also saw um, some stuff where Frankenheimer was talking. You know, John Frankenheimer, who we talked about before, directed The Comedian and, you know, Seven Days in May. 
you know, venture and candidate, all that. And uh, he, you know, he also obviously was was there at CBS. And, and he said that, that Lumet would tell him all of these crazy stories about Yul Brenner and like what, you know, like w what kind of guy he was. And uh, uh, Frankenheimer described Yul Brenner as a nonconformist. Like he just wouldn't go along with shit. Right. And he told this great story about how uh, Yul Brenner was directing like three shows a week or something at, at CBS and they and they wanted more out of him. And so uh, so they assigned him to direct an episode of What's My Line and, you know, the game show. And uh, and he he basically just he sh he was absolutely against this idea. He didn't want to do it. He showed up. He, he sat in the control room. He said to the you know, to the assistant director, or whoever, tell me when uh, when we're 24 minutes, 24 minutes in, into a 30 minute show. And uh, or whatever, and uh, he so at the at that point in it, he just uh, he said, "Okay, roll credits." And they were like, "We can't roll credits. There's four minutes of the show left. There won't be anything on after that, right?" And uh, and he's like, "Do it. I'm the director. Roll the credits, right?" And uh, you know, and then they roll the credits. It's over. There's nothing left. They he says, "Put my credit up." And they just ran his directing credit for the last like three minutes of it. And then they got out there and got the audience to applaud. <laughs> like, it, it's like, like the guy was, you know, he's like an agent of chaos in a lot of ways. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I really do. And then again, this genius man. And uh, I mean, again, uh, you'll be in today's world certainly would not likely be allowed to play some of the roles he played. And of course, Ten oh, Commandments, no, Ramsey's, yeah. but magnetic, great actor, King of Siam, magnetic, great actor, can't, can't take your eyes off him. That oh, amazing, yeah. booming yeah. voice, mm -hmm. you know, I, I very, so. very physical, very, uh, DeMille apparently was extremely fond of him. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. and, you know, Magnificent Seven. I mean, that's that's some great stuff. I mean, that's it, all it, you got to say. Yeah, if he did I mean, nothing else. And and of course, John probably wants us to just get off on a big Westworld tangent, and we can. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. But, you know. Come on. That's I the mean, first well, thing I saw him in. Yeah. Well, me too. I mean, well, I think no, a lot of people. Yeah. Damage, probably. Here, is. I'm going to I'm going to say I'm going to I'm just going to. Hell yeah. Here. I'm going to admit something here. I've never seen The King and I. Like I've never. Well, I've it's never. A great, I, I'm it's sure it's great. great. I don't know why it's one. I meant to watch it this week just for the show. Got it some other looked, stuff it, going on in my life, and I just couldn't. But you know, it uh, looks beautiful. It's got some memorable songs, though. I'm not a big fan of all of the songs. Uh, yes, his face could come off, as Lieber says, to reveal circuitry. Yes, that's which is. Uh, I mean, and that's that's one of those things you put at the bottom of your, you know, your CV you know, on the back of your, uh, you know, your photo resume. You know, like, uh, you know, can ride horses, face can come off to reveal circuitry. <laughs> yeah, give him credit though for making fun of uh, one of his great iconic roles and seeing the humor in it. Westworld, my God, what a honestly one of the best sci-fi sus suspense movies ever. The original Westworld. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I like the HBO show, fine. But, I mean, this goes from being this fun, goofy, wacky Western to all of a sudden James Rowland getting shot and uh, that movie turns on a dime. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really scary. written by Michael Crichton, uh, who then repeated the exact same premise, but with dinosaurs. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. 20 years later, and we're still watching those movies. Uh, just like we were still watching Westworld until it got to that season three. Jeez. I actually never made it that far, but uh yeah, I, I don't blame you. Yeah. I mean I had a great I, intro yeah. though. Too yeah. bad. Yeah. Great first season. Yeah. Yeah, and the first season's I, I, I love the first season. Yeah, first season was good. It was good. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I just didn't make it through the second season. I don't I think it was less about judgment and more about just like I, it was just one of those shows I lost track of. And and I don't know who directed the original storm, but I will give him I liked uh the use in the storm of the voiceover. As uh, Marsha Hunt was slowly, yeah, that, that was interesting. It's her yeah. thoughts. They did do some stuff. I mean, they, they did make some effort to, you know, they have some, uh, you know, they ran some like pre-roll film of New York, and they have that montage that takes us, you know, 
through their sort of first date or whatever. They have the, the voiceover at the end when she's, I mean, the fact that it comes out of nowhere and it's the only time we hear her voiceover, maybe a little like dramatically dubious, but it is an interesting technical thing to do for a yeah. Year, years before David Lynch would do it in Dune. Yes, yes. Uh, Arrakis, <laughs> Desert Planet. <laughs> My name is a killing word. Yeah. And uh, Marsha Hunt, uh, what a career. I mean, the woman had it all for a really long time, was in uh, the John Wayne film, Angel and the Bad Man. Uh, not that that's having it all necessarily, but a lot <laughs> of interesting roles. Uh, and then uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, I mean, and also incredibly uh, philanthropic, was very important to UNICEF and the United Nations early yeah, on. She, and like, and continue, and was, you know, she had. You know, she and you know she got blacklisted because of uh, progressive politics, right? And uh, she was one of the you know one of the people who went to uh, with Bogart and all of them to you know to Washington to right to Hollywood Penn, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, the you know, I mean, uh, you know, and and continue to be that. I mean, I, I uh, if if nobody's seen like there's an interview with her that I watched from maybe the late maybe the late eighties. Where uh, and it's the Skip E. Low show. If, if no one has has seen this, the uh, pretty rough. He's basically he's like a he's the pro. You know, he's the basis for that Martin Short. Uh, yes, you know, uh, you know, uh, okay. Jiminy Glick character. Jiminy right? Glick, yeah, he really is, and he's <laughs> almost more like that than the than the actual Jiminy Glick. But uh, he. Uh, it, it was it was interesting that she you know she was on I mean she spent half of her time on there talking about uh, you know how she was the the honorary mayor of Sherman Oaks and how she's trying to use her uh, her honorary status to help homeless people and you know uh, and uh, talking about uh, you know uh, you know the Reagan administration putting everybody out into putting you know people with uh, you know with mental illness issues out in the street and all that sort of stuff. So I mean you know it's, it was something that you know she clearly was. You know, she was clearly passionate about, you know, social causes and stuff like that. Uh, sure. But I also just want to mention she's in this great movie that I love uh, that I def that everybody should check out. It's a, a early uh, Anthony Mann directed movie, uh, an Eagle Lion movie uh, called uh, Raw Deal uh, from like, I guess, around the same time. It should have 48 probably. And uh, it's, you know, it's a low budget kind of poverty row movie, but it was shot by the great John Alton, who's, uh, you know, kind of the legendary you know, film noir cinematographer, and um, and it's also a really great movie too, though. Like, unlike T Men, the other movie that they made, which is a little bit of a boring procedural that Martin Scorsese talks about all the time, Raw Deal is like a great movie too. So I, I recommend that. I'm bringing up a Raw Deal photo. Uh, while I am trying to do that, let me also show the our favorite tie-in. Of course, there is a Star Trek uh, connection to Marsha Hunt uh, from the first season of next oh. generation too short a season uh a very weird but interesting story <laughs> where too short own... too short a season what no one said about the first uh, season of uh, star trek the next generation <laughs> <laughs> she's married to this guy that uh, is dying uh who starts off as an old man equal to marsha hunt yes. but uh takes a rejuvenation um formula of some sort that while it makes him younger it, it also is slowly killing him yeah, right. it's, 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 yeah, I, yeah, I remember this. It, it, it slowly removes his horrendous prosthetics. Yeah, like he looks, he's he doesn't look like a human being in the old age makeup. No. So, yeah. Um, the, I forgot, I thought she was in, uh, was it, I forget what it was called, the one with John Anderson, where he's the alien on the planet. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. No, planet. that's another actress. I can't think of her name now, but I, I totally know, you know, she's one of those character actors, you know. I was talking about it last night, and I unfortunately yeah. I thought, "Oh no, Marshawn's in that one." No, yeah, no, yeah. she's uh, yeah. she's in this one. Yeah. So. John Anderson, which one is that? It's the one where like he's on. It's the one with the crystalline entity, I think, right? Where they're no, on the no, planet. No, 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 no. It's they're one. They're on the planet, and you know he's created all this stuff, and he's a, uh, to, he's in order a, to keep he's, like he's posing as a human. He's got a, supposedly a wife. Uh, <laughs> I just described. I just, I just described a Star Trek episode. They're on this planet. <laughs> Like as if that narrowed things down. Well, they're the only two. I think it's called the Survivors or the Survivor, and um, yeah, like they're trying to figure out what happened to this colony. 
Yeah. They're the only ones. Go away. Leave us alone. My wife and I don't want to be disturbed. Uh, okay. Right. okay. And right. then it turns right. out that uh, John Anderson is this alien that screwed up and, and killed the entire colony. And out of guilt, God only knows why else he's staying on the planet. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I thought for a minute you were talking about Eleanor Donahue and the companion with. No, no. Yeah. Different. Metamorphosis. So, yeah, that's, that's the. Yeah. 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 Companion. That's the original series. Yeah. You love uh, Zeph from Cochrane. Clearly, please. So, um, you're dying. What can it mean to you? Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me hold up my shawl so I look like the like I can see the world through my uh, sparkly. Uh, okay, so you. this is not. Yeah, now we're just it has nothing to do with this one. Nothing to do with Yul Brenner, yeah. and then Yul Brenner shows up. Hey, uh, what happened? Okay, everybody yeah. is dead. <laughs> I don't understand why everyone is dead. I don't know if everybody. <clears throat> do you guys remember when Yul Brenner? not long before he died, did a public service announcement, just telling people I am dying of cancer. Yeah. Do well, you and smoking now. Right. I believe the, that that ran after he was dead. Like did. the it intent was, was to, for him, he recorded it, he died. And then they ran the commercial. It was, yeah. it was from a 60, pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. It was from a 60 minutes episode. And he even suggested while the cameras were rolling because he knew he was dying I could start and say, hello, I'm your Brenner. I smoked. I am now dead. Don't smoke. Okay, that's great. <laughs> that's a wrap, yeah, you all. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, you know. Old. Hey, God bless yeah. him for doing it. Seriously, Absolutely. that's yeah. awesome. Again, yeah. I love him. I'm, I'm happy that gives me the opportunity, the rare opportunity to do my Yule Brenner. That's one of the reasons why I suggested <laughs> this episode. So, listen, uh, I'm thinking uh, maybe we uh, remake uh, Ten Commandments. Uh, what do you Fair think? That. Let's what do you Although, I mean, he absolutely was. Although, you know, for all the love of Westworld, and I do like that movie, that was kind of the downward trajectory. I mean, his oh, career yeah. was in more of a downward trajectory at that point. Yeah, part. that's, that's when he and, said, ah, back to stage with me. Yeah, exactly. So, and basically after that, I mean, I guess after Future World, technically, he uh, he ended up uh, uh, just, and he's only in the weirdest little cameo type thing in Future World. Like, yeah, it, I feel like sequence. I don't remember it very well, but I feel like there was some sort of you know uh, interpretive dance involved in the uh, yes. in his cameo in Future well, World. I think, but well, Blythe Dan Well, if the whole point of Future World is to find out what went wrong in Westworld. Right. And Blythe right. Danner, I believe, plays the female lead. It's Peter Fonda and Blythe Danner. Yeah. And um, right. she is fascinated by the gunslinger character that uh, you all played, and of course, there's the robot version of him. Uh, this is obviously a publicity still. This scene doesn't show up in the movie. But yeah, it's so she's having kind of a weird fantasy about the robot. And at one point there, as you say, they're kind of dancing or whatever in a very creepy way. Yeah. And, but, yeah it, but he did. The reason why he managed to come back was uh, he reprised his role from Broadway as the King of Siam. There he is on the right and was having, a, you know, had another hit. Yeah, but uh, basically but he, that that's what he did for the rest of his career after that. I mean, he yeah. didn't live to be that old. Yes. He died in 1985, so he yes. died at 65. And uh, you know, he uh um Lieber. uh <laughs> well, you know, I mean, what was was a sci-fi movie a positive career movie for anybody in but in 1973? Well, I mean, Chuck Heston was making uh, what well, you know Soylent Green then, right? I mean, I don't know if that's good or bad because I don't know that that that, that necessarily uh, helped. After that, I made point. Earthquake and uh, well, and, what was the sniper? Uh, Air, airport, airport, airport seventy seven, yeah. maybe. Uh, <laughs> then I had a role in the Colbys, the spinoff of Dynasty. Here's the that thing. Big deal. I I weirdly kind of like whichever airport that is that uh, that uh, Charlton Heston is in. Kind of like it. It's not it's not a good movie, but they do do some really great aerial stuff, and it has a cool thing where Karen Black is in it. She plays the uh, you know the um, uh, the, the flight attendant who them, has yeah. to you know has to fly the plane. They have some crazy air to air stuff with like you know. Uh, like him, his character dropping down and trying to get through the front, the, the window, the front of the plane is blown up. I don't know why I'm pitching uh, uh, Airport 77 <laughs> so hard, but there is fun stuff. In yeah. I watched all the airports like a year ago. I don't know. Hilarious. You're killing me. Wow. Well, again, showing you the strength of the storm that we've uh, become so far removed. Yeah, uh, the all digression episode. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, 
it is i mean we gotta say though that like this is a you know it's it's 1948 this is one of the earliest things earliest episodes we've covered at all yeah and uh you know and a level of creakiness has to do with the you know with the their ability to produce it but i mean look the that's not it though nice. the script's just fucking terrible like i i, I just yeah. I, I don't i don't know yeah the execution's well, fine yeah, it's just yeah. Do you want to talk about the uh, the commercial? Yeah, sure. Let's talk yeah. about oh, the yeah. House commercials. Uh, the uh, you know the Studio One was uh, sponsored the by Pie Western Kids. House, and uh, for some reason that Pie was Kids. What they, small boys heaven. And what the hell's going on with that kid? What's what what was what what was the direction? There? Like great Wall Street tycoons, he has his fingers in many pies. Don't you get it? Yeah, I don't get it. But I, he's, he's, I, I still don't get the fucking look on his face. He's uh. Well, you know, he's on little. He, he's he's eating pie. Good. He's stuffing his face with pie. He's that yeah. cautionary uh, tale. Don't let this happen to your son. Yeah. yeah. Get Westinghouse they, appliances, and that won't be a problem. Well, apparently, the Westinghouse freezer, guys, uh, you could save enough money if you did your leftovers in it that by the next year, you're practically at the point you've spent for that Westinghouse freezer. Yeah, um, it's very cost efficient. Also, if you have a Westinghouse oven, you can bake four fucking pies in there at the same time. Absolutely. All right. You like making pies. Yeah, look. All Westinghouse appliances are your biggest cars. Yeah. I mean, look, if you have some kid and the kid is like, I'm going to stick my finger in a pie and then I'm done with it. So I need like four pies to, you know, to satisfy me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why you've got to make four pies with this yeah. kid around. Yeah, this yes, kid is Westinghouse gonna... appliances might cost as much as a child's education, but you will certainly save on food costs for next year. Now back to our shitty play, The Storm, <laughs> directed by <laughs> Will Brenner. You do you believe it? It's real Brenner. Oh. All right, who's that guy who pops up in the window at the end? Who the fuck was that? I don't know. I don't know. Like I don't know what was stuff well, just starts was happening. The, there's a body in the just ex, I know I'm an idiot but there's a body we there's don't a body see in, there's a body in the trunk that we don't see but we're never introduced to that character either right like she's his previous wife or something am I right. wrong right no that's it that's yeah it. yeah I had so to kill her she's but I not kill you and he Lord. says uh she wouldn't let me out of the thing so we're not really married you're still married to her yeah but she was so bad but she's not set up at all in the rest of the show. We don't. And then, well, then never the window breaks before. and the body's gone. Some guy peeks through the window. It's not him. Yeah, I it's, not his, it's not her brother or his brother. It's not either of them. So I I don't know what the hell. Yeah, it's like I just, uh, yeah. And then uh, it's just so my over. idea. You know, and then it ends on Yul Brenner's name for five minutes. Yes, you know, J.J. <laughs> Abrams uh, came up with the mystery box. I have the mystery uh, trunk at the window. So yeah, I think it's. Up. I feel like this is Worthington Miner's fault. Come on, like it just. Uh, oh, the, Tony Miner, don't yeah, pick on him. Tony Miner, yeah, like uh, it's tight. not. Yule showed up. He did his best. You know, like <laughs> what can you do? Watch uh, uh, Tony Randall's oral history about live TV. He uh, could not say enough great things about Worthington Miner. And and also Jack Lemon had a lot of great things to say about Miner as well. So, uh, you know, oh, there's... what? So because I always talk about Jack Klugman, uh, Jack Klugman told this story about <laughs> how um, even though Jack Klugman is not in this episode, he uh, he told the story. Boy, he would be good. Yeah, yeah it's he a told shame. A, a second. Yeah, honestly, can I just say that Jack Klugman doesn't get enough credit for? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the, no, um, the. The he just uh he like he tells a second hand story about someone, maybe it was Worthington Minor, I can't remember, going to visit Yul Brenner when he was um when he was uh you know in Dying. the King and I and it was a big success oh. and everything, going to visit him behind the behind the scenes after the whole live TV era and everything. And he uh and like he has this like um you know, this had this like very imposing African American dresser who would work with him, you know, behind the scenes, you know, dressing him for, you know, uh, you know, for every performance, who was very intimidating and and you know, uh and like kind of a uh, a buffer between 
uh, you know, the outside world, the fans and, and you know, Brenner. So when they went in there, they, him and uh, maybe it was more than good minor. I can't remember whoever his wife, but they were like, well, where, where did this guy come from? When, when did, you know, when, when did you start using this guy? And he was like, he's always been with me. Like just <laughs> the past does not exist. I get to determine what, you know, who I am and what, what happened. And I can just, you know, I can just, the, the idea that he could basically just change his, you know, his backstory at the drop of a hat and be so committed to it that, 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 it, that you can't call him on it, I think is kind of fascinating. Yeah. Um, one other Jewel Brenner thing that I, that, that sure. I, I read that he, so this, you know, he was a, he's directing live TV up into that blacklist era. Right. And, um, and so uh, at this point, people are, you know, it's at CBS there, we've talked about this before, but like they're bringing around the loyalty oath and, you know, people are struggling with what to do about it. Do I, do I sign this thing and continue to feed my family and have work or do I, you know, sell myself out and, and, you know, or what, and, or do I, you know, do I stand up for myself? And, uh, you know, the, this was the art director from, uh, you know, who had been the art director of Danger, which was, and Yul Brenner wrote a direct a bunch of episodes of Danger before. Right. This. But I, I couldn't find any of them. I would have loved to watch. Yeah, I know. I'm too. sorry, man. I know. But, uh, but like, uh, he, you know, he asked, you know, he asks, you know, the, uh, you know, one of the left wing sort of writers who was like, you know, you know, don't sign it. He asked somebody else who was like, you know, just go ahead and sign it. You got to make a living. He went to Yul Brenner and Yul Brenner was like, uh, was like, don't sign this. I, you know, don't give into these people. I would never get, you know, blah, blah, blah. And there, he was like, well, what are you going to do? And he's like, oh, I've got this, uh, I've got this part in a play, uh, you know, playing a king. Uh, so, uh, so I'm just going to fuck off and do that. So basically like, I mean, there's, there's a level of kind of, like if you look into this, the timelines don't match up quite right, and I'm not sure. You know, this is a little bit people remembering it, the the good story, but uh, you know, but basically he was kind of like uh, so. You know, he was just a guy who seemed to be able to just jump out of any situation and get into something else, and you know, stay afloat. And you know, and he 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 went off and became a star on Broadway, and completely that you know, Broadway wasn't really affected by uh, by the blacklist in the same way. And you know, he you know he managed to uh, to kind of just skip out on that and move on to the next phase of his life. Worthington Minor, a couple of facts about him: uh, not only did he create Studio One, but he also created the Goldbergs, the uh, famous Gertrude Berg uh, uh, drama comedy of of the fifties that. Mm -hmm. uh, was a very popular program. Uh, later on, he did, um, I don't know if it was live, but it certainly was staged as live, uh, The Iceman Cometh with uh, Lee J. Cobb, hmm. which is a pretty yeah. famous television production. And he had a quote about, uh, about television. He said, television could not be made to fit into preconceived patterns of motion, pictures, theater, or radio. Television offers a superlative opportunity to absorb every type of, of experiment in all other entertainment media, there's no limit to the scope of its coverage. Well, Unless there's clearly limits, it, but yeah, it's a coherent <laughs> story like uh, uh, an incoherent story like the storm. Yes, so, the, uh, the limits are the script that you wrote, Worthington Minor. Uh, I, and, believe, uh, <laughs> I believe the baseball parlance would be swing and a miss. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, Tony Minor, not very good on his game tonight for Studio One. But uh, <laughs> but they just kept producing it. They just kept making that over and yeah, over and over again. Well, again. I do yeah, kind of wish that I, I do kind of wish I'd been able to because the the previous version of it was the very first episode of Studio One, and right. uh, and then there's the later one. I kind of wish I could have watched. I mean, I say I wish I could have watched those to to compare, but maybe I don't. I don't know. Yeah. This uh, is very much like Ed Wood when Johnny Depp goes, "Oh, you didn't like look, worst thing you ever saw? Well, yeah. my next one will be better." Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wanted to say there's one bit. Uh, where they shoot her going, Hunt going up to the little clock on the mantelpiece. And it's kind of a prefigured Kubrick sort of shot where it's very centered and it's got a kind of weird sort of foreboding creepiness about it. And I was like, hey, this is kind of cool. And there wasn't a whole lot of that. But so that's why it stuck in my head. Yeah, but it's I do feel like they were trying, right? I don't feel yeah, like I mean we watched some whatever stuff. We watched some stuff, especially this very early stuff, where it just felt like, 
point a camera at something. Hopefully somebody remembers some lines like, you know, it, yeah. and this didn't feel like that at all. This was yeah. produced. It was something, you know, it was functionally, it was well-made. It was, uh, you know, the, and the actors are, are generally good. It's just, I mean, you know, within material. the limits of the material. I also yeah. like when you see the pickpocket sitting there kind of pondering the money he stole from her. And he just sort of gives a little evil smile. And that's the last you see of that guy. Right. That's everything in the script. The, the, the finale is something we've never set up. The, you know, like the, you know, that you introduce characters that never come back again. Like these are, it's like a play with like five characters in it. And you can't, and you, yet everything is sort of random. It doesn't have like, where's fucking Anton Chekhov? I mean, like just set something up and pay it off. All right, you gave me nothing to work with, so I'm going to have a lot of people running around doing various things. Even though it's not connected, it's early television, so people will watch. So it's good. Yeah, it's Hello. true, though. Like people would people would watch it because it was on, you know, so right. whatever. You know. Right. Yeah, check off, check off's rule about a clock on the mantelpiece. That <laughs> clock should have been used in the last uh, act. <laughs> yeah, she should have you, clunked him on the you, head with it. Yeah. Are you confusing Chekhov with Robert McKee and the gun yes. on the wall? Thank no, you. the gun. The gun on no. the wall is Chekhov. That's it's Chekhov. Yeah. Well, I always thought that was McKee. Excuse it's me. McKee oh my talking God, about John. Chekhov. I love you. Yes. That's fantastic. Yes. It's Tell equal. Yeah, Robert McKee and <laughs> Chekhov are pretty much the same thing. <laughs> well, and, and again, there's our Star Trek tie-in that later on Chekhov would show up in the second season of Star Trek as uh, the navigator. Okay, we're done. Uh See you later. <laughs> This episode is over. I'm, I'm surprised. Uh, I'm, now, I'm, I'm staying as the kid from Daddy O. <laughs> Absolutely, man. The rest and, of the uh, show. And once again, uh, buy a Westinghouse appliance so your child can uh, uh, befoul uh, a pie. Uh, this is this is pre-American pie. So uh, fantastic. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. Uh, we're so, taking a hiatus uh, next week because uh, uh, we can't all be here next uh, week. And that's yeah, okay. it's my fault. It's my fault. I'm moving. It's life is you know is complicated. We'll, I pr probably we're not doing next week. So uh, you know, so the following week, what are we doing, John? Uh, let's look at Paul Lynn. Uh, Paul Lynn. Paul let's Lynn. Paul Lynn. Hell yeah. Paul let's Lynn's look career. at Paul Lynn. It's uh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's <laughs> oh Sammy. No, Center Square. Center Square. The, uh, like we're gonna get, we're gonna need more people, you know, more guests on, so that we can create the Center Square experience. I'm sorry, you wait I, till I we do the Corman cast. We'll have guests just pouring oh, out. Absolutely, hey, you, absolutely. you showed our hand exactly. Uh, um, we, I think no, we I literally about, came um, up with the I, I think we came up with the idea of the Corman cast all, within the actual show last time. I don't think we were just true. talking about that afterwards. Right, good point. Uh, but, um, but I can't <laughs> stop thinking about it. I look. I've been. I've. I've been looking into it. I just don't know uh, if if we can handle doing five hundred and fourteen movies. Uh, at, we, we don't have to do everything. <laughs> have to do every really? Because I'm a completist and I have rules. So I feel like we're gonna you start know, at Highway Dragnet and we're gonna end at Sharktopus <laughs> versus something a puss. You know? I was <laughs> I was talking to Susan Eisenberg, the great voice actor, who of course known as Wonder Woman and uh, the great Justice League cartoons. And I was telling her, hey, you know, we're going to do Kinescope later. And I'm like, you know, Susan, we'd love to have you come on because you love old Hollywood. And yeah. that's one of the reasons why we do Kinescope is to show the ties to, uh, you know, actors and, and directors. And she's like, do you love uh, crafts? Have you done craft suspense theater? And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. That doesn't count because that's not live TV. That's that's a great early 60s anthology show. But that was filmed. And I said, yeah. Dave Hardman will not allow us. <laughs> I, I'm not, look, I got rules. I'm sorry. There's rules. Uh, the, so, like, why do anything if you don't have any rules? I understand. And, uh, <laughs> so, so, but no, we're anyway. going to talk about Paul Newman's early acting in television. He's another, like James Dean, uh, did a lot of live TV alongside his movie career. And uh, I do know that there's a sci fi Tales of Tomorrow, mm -hmm. <laughs> but he's, he's it's a small role. But he yeah. shows up. And in fact, yeah. I remember him making fun of it on Letterman on one of his many uh, guest appearances on Letterman. And they showed the clip and everything. And in that one, the world is uh, actually pro uh, appropriate for today's concerns about uh, climate change. It's about uh, a new ice age uh, approaching the earth. And uh, that's okay. that from the tomorrow. Great. I got to yeah. tell you, for that shoestring budget, 
They had a lot of interesting ideas on that sci-fi show. Okay. Well, cool. So it, it'll be a good opportunity to talk about that. I think there's a note, there's probably a studio one or something like that, that that's all to throw so. in. Uh, no, there is. I just can't think of it. Uh, I can't, can't think of the it. title at the moment, but that, but there is. So we'll look at a couple different things from Paul Newman's early career. There you go. And then if we if we could find something that Paul Lynn is in that, that fits the criteria of Kinescope, then we could definitely cover that too. Kids, I don't know what's wrong with these kids today. <laughs> Absolutely. So, all right, uh, and I, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm halfway through Peter Marshall's autobiography, and I think that's why Paul Lynn is on my brain. <laughs> okay, there as if go. Paul Lynn isn't always on your mind. Yeah, come on, yeah. come on, Joe. Oh. All right. <laughs> anyway, don't, don't don't conflate him with Charles Nelson Riley. Paul, that's true. Paul Lynn is his own person. Very different. Very very different. All right, good point. Uh, all right, so uh, join us again in two weeks for the uh, next Kinescope. Uh, and uh, coming soon <laughs> to your very uh, YouTubes, uh, it'll be the Corman cast. Uh, the, the Which not, is not going to be called that, so it's going to be a little confusing. Well, but, we'll find know. a title. What, what is more, and honestly, I keep meaning It's better than the Corman cast. Yeah. I defy you to find a better title that still <laughs> says what it is. Well, it should probably be the Roger Corman cast because it could be like Corman I, anybody. But whatever. The we'll, we'll figure it out. The, that gives us the opportunity to explore Harvey Corman as much as Roger Corman. Yes, actually, yeah. we can alternate. So it will we'll cover every single thing that Harvey Corman ever appeared in, this, alternating this, weeks with the the Roger Corman yes. movies, and it, the show will go on for twenty years. There's exactly. already ten years worth of material just in Roger Corman's. Uh, this week, Little Shop of Horrors. Next week, America Thon. Yes, absolutely, uh, featuring Elvis Costello. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's go all right thanks everybody uh we'll see you uh, for the next kinescope in two weeks bye-bye our report details how advertising through television transforms strangers to your product into acquaintances and acquaintances into friends and friends into customers. You could almost say, as a result, that television puts into every living room a 